Hold on to your butts. We are changing the course of history as we see it. That is what Wesker demands. Now this affects Iris. Um, Iris, where are you? What you feel only matters to you. I do not entertain hypotheticals. The world as it is is vexing enough. Iris, I have a tip for you. Don't take drugs! Or whatever movies with Wesley and Iris. What up, and welcome to Or Whatever Movies. I'm your co-host, Iris, and I'm here with my older brother. Wesley! That's like the commandy voice. And today we're talking a movie in theaters and available on HBO Max. Dune, 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 dune. So relieved to finally review this movie and thankful that you've boned up on all the Dune history. All six books, probably comic books, nerd legend lore. I'm so grateful that you'll be captaining and championing this episode. Don't forget David Lynch's Dune. Yep. Beloved worldwide. Is David Lynch's Dune a cult classic? I think that if Jurassic Park had been a failure, it would have been remembered for Jeff Goldblum's Harry Manchest, like the meme where he's all laid out on the table. And likewise, I think Dune is largely remembered for Half-Naked Sting. Well, we get a full-on naked Oscar Isaac. Well, you don't get, like, dong or anything. Well, I mean, strategically hidden by a table dong. Yeah. But he's kind of, like, oddly shiny. <laughs> like, he's almost oiled up for his, his dinner. He's distressed and sweaty. When you got Colonel Kurtz interrogating you, man, you know things aren't going to end well. And by Colonel Kurtz, you mean Stellan Skarsgård? Yeah, I made a little choky noise, and I was like, is that Stellan Because I thought the apex of his slimy grossness was in Pirates of the Caribbean when he was all, like, seashelled and, like, waterlogged. Remember that? And I was like, whoa. Yeah, because he's ultra gross in this, but not as gross as the Baron from David Lynch's. But that will be my last David Lynch comparison because these really these movies really aren't comparable, are they? Well, they're not for me because I saw Dune once upon a time, decades ago, and not since. Yeah, you were strangely resistant to reviewing this version of Dune. Why is that? <sighs> I consider Dune, and I cannot imagine I'm alone here, to be the dorkiest of dork movies and dork books. There's a special class of dude who maintains that Dune is his all-time favorite book. And worse, if it's his all-time favorite movie, just there's something about Dune. It's just so sci-fi, dork nerd, ultra fantasy. I don't know. I mean, more than Lord of the Rings trilogy dorks, more than Marvel dorks and comic book dorks. I was one of the Lord of the Rings dorks. And because they're well-made movies, for the most part, I was a Marvel dork, definitely not a DC dork. I feel like there are two camps. I feel like there are Atreides and there are Macomiums or what was the other one? Are you talking about the Hark the Harkonnens? Is Harkonnen the family, the other family name? Well, it's a house. Right. So the house of Harkonnen and the house of Atreides. And I was in the Atreides camp and the, the dorks were the Harkonnens. I don't get the, the metaphor. Lord of the Rings fandom and Dune fandom, in my opinion, are not the same. But in that analogy, you're saying that the Lord of the Rings dorks are the good guys and the Dune dorks are the bad guys. I'm glad you understand. <laughs> the Harkonnens are bad baddies. Yep. And the, for the most part, the, our, the House of Trades peeps are like all of standing and integrity filled and like loving towards each other. How many people does Timothy Chalamet hug? He's a hugger. I personally think that Timothy Chalamet is an inspired choice for Paul Atreides. I'm actually shocked by how, I mean, he's kind of a lithe little wiry dude. Like, I think he would make a good Spider-Man, but he's a little bit too soulful. <laughs> well, he's definitely rocking an emo performance, yeah. an emo manifestation of Paul Atreides. He's got the, he's got the soulfulness unlock. I don't know that anybody looks through their lashes better than Timothy Chalamet and this little bashful looks that he gives. Under the hair and from his emo suit. He's like going to a My Chemical <laughs> Romance concert. <laughs> and also, I was kind of floored by that little bashful blushing look that he gives Zendaya at the end. I was like, that was cute. Yeah, I was a little bit shocked. 
He seemed like too slight to be taken seriously. He seems like a little kid. And I don't know that Paul Atreides is necessarily little. Did I read somewhere that he's supposed to be 15 or the like? Uh, You'd know better than I, but he certainly wasn't dwarfed by Jason Momoa. Uh, Well, height-wise, but Jason Momoa is a gigantic dude, both height-wise and build-wise. And next to him, Timothy Chalamet wasn't like crazy small. I was like, whoa. He's the one you got to watch out for, man. Because you know that Inigo Montoya, what was his name? Idaho Potato Protector. <laughs> what is it? What was his name? <laughs> Think Dunkin' Donuts Idaho Potato. Yeah. You can tell he's the warrior, right? If you can take down the big dude and the other little wiry dude sees you take down the obvious warrior, don't stick around. Because the little guy, if he's not running after he sees you defeat the big bad warrior, he's going to cut you. Okay, but the people who take down Duncan Idaho never get a crack at Paul Atreides because he flees in that awesome helicopter thing. Right. Which, by the way... The Orenthopter. How cool was that aircraft? The little dragonfly dudes? That was cool. Yeah. When they, like, all go tuck wing and dive? Yeah, the dive... Very dramatic. I fully expected the dive maneuver to be utilized again, a la uh, The Force Awakens when they do the nose dive in the, the Millennium Falcon, but it didn't get used. You got Timothy Chalamet, you got Oscar Isaac, Jace Momoa, Josh Brolin, Javier Bardem. All dudes who can throw down, but who are all soulful, kind of softy, kind of emo types. Yeah. I mean, we talked about Josh Brolin's sweetheart side. You know, the the soft side that always compliments his, like, hard, crusty exterior, <laughs> like in Labor Day? Yeah, the soulful side of him. The Llewellyn side, you know, the Llewellyn, you know, clearly having a love for his wife side. Oh, no country for... Hey, this is their reunion. What? Josh Brolin and Javier Bardem. Wow. I didn't make that connection until now. That's surprising. It's a good call. But yeah, they all have this really soulful thing that's going on. I mean, maybe Jason Momoa a little bit less, but you can still see him as like um, a fairly sensitive horse guy (laughs) in Game of Thrones. He was the call Drogo. I think a little bit of this also comes from Jason Momoa's real life personality. Like, yeah, he's the big beard having long hair, lots of swords, throws axes in his spare time and does the haka dance and all that. But also he's like all smiles and hugs and, and super affable. Like he's all teddy bear? Yeah, and I think that that plays a lot in this, where you see, yes, of course he throws down and kills a bunch of people and then gets killed himself and rises from the grave to kill more people. But still, he was all (laughs) like the total smiley big brother protector type. Yeah, I think that was hug number one. And I expected at the core of this, there's basically a very simple fairy tale, wolf walkers, you know, from another class, but yet going to join the Spices out in the fields and go to ground. And he's like Robin Hood in the forest. It's a, it's a pretty standard premise, just made to look more more flashy and more spectacle-like, but still pretty grounded by his emotional performance, which I appreciated. Yeah, I think that Timothy Chalamet didn't raise his voice but once. Yeah, when he was screaming at that dude to yield him before he knifed him. <laughs> Okay, twice. Then, and when he barks at his mom to back off. Oh, yeah. I mean, and he kind of, you know, in that scene, he's really losing it, or he's, you know, embracing his chosenness. He goes by many names in this, and I was going to ask you about them, but I'm I'm already sensing that you're not tracking on the lore. When I first encountered Dune, there's lots of apostrophes and lots of unpronounceable names, and I get, in retrospect, that a lot of this lore... A lot of this religion may have its roots in Arabic traditions. I didn't care about any of that. I was like, these names are stupid. And if you want to try to be as different and otherworldly and science fiction-y as possible, you choose ridiculous, absurd, unpronounceable, unwieldy names with lots of apostrophes and Zs in it. And so it annoyed me to have to try to keep up with this. It's very dense, and I just, I didn't want to, I read The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings multiple times. Did I read The Silmarillion? No. Do I need to get that deep? No. We're talking about like 8,000 years of lore or something. This is like 8,000 years in the future. 
and they hit us pretty hard up top. Not a lot happens, and we hear all about the... the uh, Are you talking about the book or the movie right now? I don't know. I don't know if this is our world or if this is in a galaxy far, far away. Grandma with the with the hurdy hand toaster test was like, be well, small human or whatever, and takes off. And I was like, wait, he's not human? Are these people not human? Do I know? No. Do I care? No. <laughs> this movie's responsibility is to set us up and make us feel comfortable in a world where we have to care about the people and the lore doesn't it's not like this thing has to come with a disclaimer it's like dude before you see our movie read dune and then read this flow chart of all the dune happenings from the year 2021 till the year 18492 or whatever they dropped us in the middle of yeah, it was like 11,000 something something. But I thought that the filmmakers were pretty even handed about this stuff. Like we get a very human drama in this representation of Dune. Oh, yeah? What's... And yet I think there's a ton of fan service, like adherence to the original David Lynch film. And I'm not sure about the book so much, but it seemed faithful to what I remember of Dune. And <sighs> Brian multiple times in the viewing of this film was like, I love everything about this movie. Like super nerding out like the entire time. I'll tell you what I appreciated, jumping way ahead to the end, end credits roll, and Kelly looks at me, and I was afraid that she was going to be all about this. I was afraid she was going to make us read Dune. <laughs> and then when the credits rolled, she looked at me and was like, I guess it was well done if you care. And I was like, that wow. is exactly how I feel. Did Dune look great? Absolutely. Did, was he even handed with the lore and the religion and the history of the families and the political, etc.? And absolutely he was. Did I care? Just barely enough to keep me sustained. Like, did I need to learn what a Bene Gesserit was? Yes, I did. Did I figure it out ultimately? Not really. I think it was the old lady religion and there was some connection with the mom and stuff. Don't care. A lot, a lot of dense lore that uh, you're going to have to spoon feed me, which maybe is the strength of wow. this movie for being the longest trailer for the actual movie that I've ever seen. This movie was like, what, two hours and 40 minutes long? 2.35. And nothing happened. In the entire movie. He didn't even become the blue-eyed dude. None of the real stuff what are happened. What talking about? He wasn't going to take his place. Among the Spice Girls or whatever to be the the one the chosen one. This is like the preface and the history before we get into the Matrix and we find out whether or not Keanu Reeves is the one. Listen, I understand what you're what you're saying, but they're laying a foundation, and I can't help but think you're just your immediate satisfaction. Drop all six episodes immediately. You know, <laughs> like need is like is rearing up because you didn't see him become the one. <laughs> the full concrete, spicy concrete foundation that's going to take years to cure. I'm not happy about waiting two, three years to see Dune Part 2, but am I looking forward to it? Yes. Sure. And that's because Dune surmounted my expectations for being the lame David Lynch movie that I remember and taking this away from the dorks enough to normalize it, to make it palatable for audiences coming in, being like, all right, Dune, let's see what you got. It can't be like, Dune. Like, you're going to have to feed this to me in a way that I don't choke or get sick of it you didn't get carried away I, I did it was enough to keep me engaged i was like man he's just earning his place so he's not going to get killed by javier bardem's jawa crew or whatever and i was like okay now this thing's really gonna start ah oh, roll credits and then you realize how quickly two and a half hours go by when you're immersed in a story. Because we finally got out into the dirt. We finally got down to the nitty gritty, the spicy dicey stuff. And we were out of the rooms with the carefully recessed lighting and the wandering around up and down the steps and stuff. I wanted to get out on Arrakis and see some sandworms and use some knives and really get into thick of it, the thick of it, which we finally did. I mean, what about the massive Harkonnen attack on House Atreides and the betrayal of Dr. Ewan and all that kind of stuff? You were just like, mm -hmm, let's get to Arrakis. No, it was all necessary setup. I didn't see the betrayal coming, especially by the doctor, who was the one that had the most access to everybody. Yeah, all that was fine, but not unlike Game of Thrones. Uh, what was his name? Ditto. Leto. Leto went out pretty quickly in true Sean Bean fashion. Didn't even succeed in his mission to take out Colonel Kurtz along the way with his death breath, with his morning breath. 
And uh, and so I was like, okay, we lost Oscar Isaac really, really quickly. That was like an hour and a half in the movie. <laughs> right. But for the scope, because Dune, this is going to be six movies long for sure. Well, they at least announced the trilogy, and I was surprised to see that part two was only just greenlit. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, that's what I was going to bring up. I did not hear a trilogy, so that's interesting. Not at all surprising, because there are six Dune books that I've been avoiding for the last 45 years. But he always intended, obviously, and I didn't know this going in. I thought this was going to be pretty much fully contained, as aware as I was that there were multiple books. I thought this movie is going to tell the Dune story, and then if they want to spin it off later, they can. He want, Denis Villeneuve, the director of Dune 2021, always intended to make a two-part Dune at least, because the studio said, we understand what you want to do. We know that you want to make this a two-part Dune, but we're not greenlighting part two until part one does well. So they needed to get it done. And already this has been delayed because of coronavirus. It should have been released a year ago, give or take. I think it was December, just now hitting the ground. And they're like, okay, we'll go ahead and greenlight pre-production and prep for Dune part two. Yeah, that's crazy. And I'm wondering if the fairly successful box office of Dune Part 1 is actually going to facilitate bankrolling Dune Part 2. But my understanding, and this may be hearsay, is that Denis Villeneuve is intending to do a trilogy based on the first two books. Okay. Hadn't heard that. Interesting. We're in it for the long run. I know, but I don't want to wait two and a half years to see Dune Part 2. This is your fault for getting invested in Dune Part 1. He did Blade Runner 2049, and he did... Another remake. Uh, Arrival. He said that he those two movies he, he did were all in preparation for Dune. He didn't have the clout, and he didn't have the experience to do Dune, but this is what he's wanted to do since he was a kid. So this is the culmination of all his efforts and his experience, and both Arrival and... Blade Runner, not quite as much, but Arrival was a big deal, and Oscars were involved in that and stuff. So I, ex- I fully expect he'll go all James Cameron and retire to the world of Dune and wander the hills with like a cloth-wrapped shotgun and just churn these out for the next decade. <laughs> the James Cameron reference um, definitely came to mind that he's just going to be living in and producing in this world. So did you think that Denis Villeneuve... Nov? Nov? Did you think that the Babadook was successful? <laughs> Did I think what? Did you think that the Babadook was was successful in do- with Dune? I'm pretty sure it's doing well. It's well regarded. It's a very risky gamble. I mean, he's putting it out there for a not complete movie. It's almost as if he cliffhangered a season of Dune, the television show. It went a long way and there was a lot of effort and it was extremely expensive. And they're like, we're going to hope and dangle this in the wind to see if we ever get to see his spicy visions come to pass. We saw some of them, but not all of them because he doesn't have the blue eyeballs yet. And uh, hopefully Timothy Chalamet doesn't get all jacked or lose his hair or anything in the time it takes him to make part two because we got a long way to go. And Zendaya is going to be like 30. (laughs) He was looking a little Edward Scissorhands. Dude, you know this dude? dude. He's already been, so he's going he's gonna to have to wait because they're not shooting Dune Part 2 yet, but they just released the stills of him as young Gene Wilder in the Willy Wonka prequel. No way. It's eerie. I mean, Dune was put together really well, I think enough to justify a sequel. Now, look, it wasn't all that different from Arrival or from Blade Runner. Stylistically, a kind of a lot of what I saw is him masking scope, you know, because you have giant sweeping spaceship shots or war scenes and stuff where it's like bright as day. Right. But all of his expansive shots all have sand haze or fog mm-hmm. or mist or something that kind of yep. contains the the limits of the scope that he can show on screen. I don't know if we saw a lot different. I really wanted to see how hard he would flex those sandworms and the answer is not very flexy because he only showed them a little bit. I mean they're a big thing and we were all waiting for them. And then the most notable <laughs> was that sometimes I couldn't tell if the sound effects and the score were from the composer or from the movie. Like I became convinced <laughs> that The ships, when they take off, they chant really loud. It's like they hit the thruster and the ship goes. You could just sum it all up. We could just say sound editing, 
score. It just all, it, you can just sum it all up with, with overall soundscape. Yep. And the Harkonnen, I want to be like the uh, official didgeridoo player of the Harkonnen. The show up and it's like, <laughs> no, that was. Da, wah. <laughs> I think that was throat singing. Okay. Like, like Himalayan throat singing. Okay. Or Mongolian Someone's throat doing singing. it. I, I couldn't tell if their machinery was doing it or if they had the dude, he was like the guitar <laughs> player on the front of the thing in Mad Max. It was like a vaguely, it was like, what's that noise? That's desert power, yo. <laughs> isn't that what he's, isn't that his like last words when he sees someone like riding, surfing the worm? That's the MacGuffin. Desert power was the force. The spice was the MacGuffin and desert power was the force. How did he do that? Desert power. How did he ride the worm? <laughs> desert power. Spice world. I could, I can tell you really don't care about this. Like you don't care. Like, why don't you care about Doom? <laughs> gigantic sprawling movie with a fantastic cast some people seem to belong more than others like what's that dude doing here but other people seem to fit in well even if they were rather quickly disposed of but i maintain that you have to sit down and be like give me it dune and it cannot come with any of these preconceived notions unfortunately realistically practically speaking it does you got to make a decision because Denis Villeneuve is really pissed at the idea that people wouldn't see this in 70 millimeter IMAX and the fact that a lot of people are watching it at home or whatever uh, he may, he says that HBO might have killed his box office and thus prevented him from making Dune 2. And HBO Warner were like, nah, it's, it's good. Relax. We understand it's a different thing. And it won't, the HBO tracking won't affect box office as much because we're watching those numbers as well. It's all, it's all relative. It already made $44 million in its opening weekend. And the budget was, I mean, in terms of its scope, the budget was probably fairly modest at a, you know, like you can easy spend 165 and change on a Marvel movie. I'm saying this is nerd cinema of the highest level. Like this is the ultimate nerd movie. And I think it satisfied a lot of people in that respect. Like you said, maybe not quite fan service, but at least fan respect. I mean, Dune, we have to recall, preceded Star Wars, and Dune may have influenced a lot of the desert aspects of Star Wars. So it deserves its respect in the same way that everyone likes, is like Game of Thrones, and they're like, oh yeah, but Lord of the Rings came before that, but Lord of the Rings kind of came before everything. Well, why are you being all flippant and not reverent? I was a little bit annoyed by the fact that I did get sucked in and was like, all right, I'm on board. Let's see where we're going. Oh, the movie's over. See you in a few years, Dune 2. It's fine. No real flaws with Dune. It just seemed very operatic and grand and like the ultimate cast of a lifetime for it to be like, yeah, all right, it's over. In what movie is the lead character leaning over head and hand saying, I just never let it in? Babadook? I just never let it. Sam? <laughs> Don't let it in. Don't let it in. Don't let it in. Uh, no. Is it Smeagol bent over the river when the Precious no. is talking to him? It's Titanic. And when you're on board the Keldish and you're looking back at Dune, you're going to be like all remorseful because you never let it in. You got to let it in, dude. I have this, like the minorest criticisms for Dune. And believe me, me, when Brian gets all stoked about a movie, I like like look to poke holes in it. And I have very few criticisms for Dune. Like there's a couple overacting moments, but mostly very grounded and, and, and actually kind of subtle, especially with Timothy Chalamet leading that tone and the special effects. Like there was nothing special effects wise that made me groan or took me out. Very masterful use of camouflaging. I mean, story-wise, story -wise, it made a lot of sense that the war happened at night. But visual effects-wise, I think it really helped it out. The direction was very tasteful when when they're when it's showcasing these aircraft and spaceships and stuff like you know choosing close-ups and very it was very story driven and there were all these like wide grown worthy shots of bad visual effects like and color wise it was all all very consistent amazing cast like i really don't have anything bad to say about dune i'll tell you what i loathe about dune as a concept did you watch raised by wolves also on hbo no Ridley Scott is one of the great directors of our time. Love Ridley Scott. He brought us Alien and Gladiator and all that good stuff. But Raised by Wolves suffers from the same problem that Dune does. And Dune's problem is I loathe the clash of imperialism and religion. 
I loathe that they're going to come in and change the way this religion has operated for eons and junk. And there's a guy and he has power and he may be the one that this really, even though he comes from a different class, a different place in the universe and, and the spice amplifies his vision and he is chosen Bene Gesserit Iraqi and Moardibian frickin' dude. And I, I the hate- The Meshach Hazarak? I loathe the robes and the mysticism and the floaty Buddha type evil guys. I hate all that shit. I hate when people act in movies and an entire civilization and a species is so wrapped up in the religion just to have like like Pandora, just to have Quaritch and his team come in and like chop down their tree and gun them all down, you know? Because you're <laughs> expected to side with the mystics and the holy people and I just don't care. Well, so then what, where does that place you on the Moab Deep? Are you think, do you think that he's a bad guy or a good guy? Intensely skeptical. A, a name, by the way, which never once came up in this movie. I think it did. It never came up. I was waiting for it because it's a dumb apostrophe name. He doesn't become that character until he is, is revealed or whatever or confirmed to be the one. I'm pretty sure they did, but they used Kisat's, Kisat's Haderach all over the place. <laughs> I don't know who you're talking about. They were Quisats hatteracking everybody. Yeah. So Nick Knack Paddywhack was a good guy or a bad guy? <laughs> That's my question. Exactly. I have no idea. Don't care. And the fact that we had the subtitles on, because you're, this was a volume button writing movie for sure. Um, oh, for sure. The, the fact that I had the subtitles on and still had no idea what they were talking about, this movie would have been mystifying and confounding if I was left to my ears to figure out what was going on. So so basically what you're saying is that you have problems with the Messiah parable at an inherent level. And regardless of the fact that Dune was expertly crafted and executed, you don't care. I'm saying you come at it with a Brian level of enthusiasm and it's my job to poke holes in it. I'm going to give Dune a solid all right rating. Does it need to be seen? Only if you're a dork. But... Is it worth investing your time in? Sure. I was a little bit mad that they strung us along and now we have to wait for years for like it to really throw down. But like you, it was really hard to find real fault that didn't exist in the source material. To take a really unwieldy book, or and by book I mean a series of six books, and pull it off in a way that made an impression and got me invested is no small feat. Is Denis Villeneuve the visionary director everyone says he is? I mean, maybe, but his movies are aren't that distinct to me, at least it's from one another. Maybe he's the Guillermo del Toro of the French science fiction space in that everybody loves him, <laughs> but does he have anything really quality to show that cements his reputation as an all-time amazing filmmaker? I don't think we're there yet, and I don't think Dune is it. I mean, I'm guessing that James Cameron will probably stand after his initial successes with Terminator and stuff, probably as Titanic. I mean, we're on the cusp of more avatars, many more, but do you think that defines his legacy? Do you think Dune will be Denis Villeneuve's stamp on filmmaking for all time? I'm not sure we're there yet. I think he's got a lot of promise. We'll see what comes out of this dude. Dune was satisfying... It's like if you go to like a prefix menu with like many different courses and you get a whole bunch of good stuff that's a little bit weird because you've never had squid ink or spices before. And then you like, oh, that, that was pretty good. I didn't expect that. But you only got like a little piece of it because you have to move on to the next course. That's what Dune was like. It was like a it was like a delicious, nearly three hour spicy appetizer. <laughs> Dune Part 1, the amuse-bouche of cinema. <laughs> Which they let us know right up front. They're like, hey, this three-hour movie you're about to watch, it's Part 1. <laughs> at least it hit us with Chapter 1 at the very end during the credits. 
Yeah. Brian and I debated this and we we were ultimately glad that he, they let us in at the top because I think if we had gotten to that point and then found out we have nothing else to go on, that we would have been really disappointed and enraged. But, I, th- I think that can go either way. But I was disappointed and enraged after I found out what it too, chapter two, ultimately became. So you'll forgive me if I temper my enthusiasm for Dune 2. And there you have it. That's wait. No, I haven't given my good. My good. It was obvious. Given my enthusiasm, I suppose it's obvious that I will give Dune a good. You're drinking the Kool-Aid even though it has sand in it. And I, I mean, I just waited two plus years for Succession, and now I gotta wear, wait another two plus years for Dune Part Two. That's why I don't watch series. It's just too long. But nevertheless, I will be there for Dune Part Two. In fact, Brian may even drag me to see Dune Part One in IMAX. And I may let him because that's how good Dune Part 1 was. And there you have it. That's our review on Dune Part 1. You got a solid all right from Wes, a good from Iris. I didn't know what way this review would go since I knew that you were all ambivalent and weird about reviewing this movie. But I'm glad that we did. And I'm glad that I was able to share a little bit of my industry knowledge about what to expect from Dune Part 2 and Denis Villeneuve. Let us know what you think about Dune. 818-835-0473. Are you a Harkonnen dork or are you a Lord of the Rings dork? Come on. You know you got no shortage of opinions. Hit us up, people. Or whatever movies at gmail.com at or whatever movies on Instagram. We love to hear from you. We love your support. Please subscribe to our podcast or whatever movies. So thanks for listening and we'll see you next time. Like three years from now. Goodbye. Goodbye.